Hello, and welcome to the Symmetry Partners update and review for the second quarter of 2020. My name is Casey Dillon. I am the Director of Investment Communications at Symmetry. I'm joined by one of our founding partners, Patrick Sweeney, as well as one of the managing directors at the firm and president of the Panoramic Funds, Dana Dioria. On the call today, we'll be taking a look at how various markets and risk assets have performed over the quarter with the goal of contextualizing those uh, through the lens of longer term per perspective. During our presentation, please feel free to type any questions that you might have into the GoToWebinar toolbar, uh, and we will try to address those uh, or as many of those as we can at the end of our session. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Pat Sweeney to share a few comments. Pat. Thank you, Casey. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to just open this um, discussion and this presentation up with a few pointers to help those of you uh, who are uh, concerned about the markets um, because of what's going on around us in our society and our economy. Um, it's a scary time and, and uh, we understand that uh, there are many people out there hurting, there are many people out there uh, who are worried about a, a paycheck uh, at the very least, if not a, a paycheck and where their next meal is coming from. Um, however, uh, there's appears to be a disconnect when you turn on the evening news and you see how the stock market is doing. Um, and this brings a question up that we get constantly is the stock market appears to be doing okay by some measure, um, while the economy uh, due to COVID-19 is clearly doing poorly and, and will remain uh, in this condition for, for some time to come. So uh, let's take a brief look at that. Uh, many years from now, young people who uh, were too young to remember the year 2020 or weren't born yet, many years from now, they'll look back um, at the returns of the stock market. Maybe they'll be in a finance class somewhere doing a report, or maybe they'll be um, out in the workforce. And they'll see in all likelihood that it was a, a pretty unspectacular year for financial markets. Uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, so far this year is down about 7%. And for the trailing 12 months, it's flat. It's pretty much unchanged. Uh, global markets are down about 9% year to date and about 4%, depending on which index you look at, over the last 12 months. Uh, the only one that's uh, doing particularly better is the Standard & Poor's 500 index, which is flat year to date, and it's up 7% uh, over the last 12 months. And really, uh, we can uh, take a good hard look at what's driving the returns of the S&P 500. My colleague Dana Dioria will, will go into depth on this later in the broadcast and, and perhaps Casey will touch on it as well. But really just five large companies are driving the returns of the S&P 500, five large technology companies, uh, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Google Parent, Alphabet, and Netflix. So uh, that's not uncommon to have some very large stocks driving an index. Uh, but by and large, this doesn't appear to be a terrible market environment. The economy is something that we see in the newspapers and on the nightly news and hear about daily. But markets tend to be forward looking. And so what we're doing and uh, what we're seeing in markets is uh, what we like to say in our business is discounting the future. What really all it means is all of this news is baked into the stock market already. It's not news that businesses are doing poorly and second quarter earnings are going to be bad. Uh, we know that. So the market is anticipating some type of rebound later in the year, perhaps early 2021. So don't get confused about headlines versus what the market is doing. A broadly diversified approach to investing that, that we practice at Symmetry um, will typically uh, follow the broad indexes to a certain extent um, and we don't pay attention we don't play we don't make tactical decisions on what's happening in the markets at present we look at uh, uh, academic uh, literature and we look at what we consider to be uh, third party objective research we conduct our own research as well and we make informed decisions about what's going to happen in the market for years to come, as opposed to what's happening today or even in the coming months. 
So with that, um, I'm gonna hand it uh, off to my colleagues to give you a more in-depth look uh, and uh, I'll come back at the end of the broadcast and uh, summarize what we've talked about. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Dana. Thank you, Pat. For those of you who were joining our call, uh, you know, a, a few months ago when we were looking back on the first quarter, um, you would remember a, a very different picture than what you're seeing here in front of you. Um, certainly first quarter, and, and mind you, I want to orient everyone to this slide. We're showing you now performance of stocks and bonds through the most recent quarter period. But what you're looking at here is not just um, the quarter, which you see on top there, you're looking at also um, the, the past 12 months, so the one-year performance, the three-year, the five-year, and the 10-year. And all around, pretty much, you can see that it was a phenomenal quarter for the market in quarter two. And I'm sure those of you who are paying attention to news media on this topic know that uh, the drop that we had was extremely violent um, and, you know, to a certain extent, record-setting. And, in, and then in the second quarter, we had the exact opposite. We had the market come back um, to a roaring kind of success and kind of even out to where Pat just talked about if he took the two quarters together. But I think something that's well worth uh, looking at and thinking about here is that if you were uh, paying attention in that first quarter call, you would have seen the red arrows, not just for the quarter performance, right, which is at the top here, but if you were if you were on that call, you would have seen that we also had negative performance for the entire past 12 months as a result. And for international stocks, the negative performance penetrated all the way down to the five-year period. Um, and for emerging, penetrated down to the three-year period. Why do I bring this up? Because I think it's important for people to understand that when they see these returns, you know, a one-year, a three-year, a five-year, what's happening in a lot of cases is that a big return in any portion of that period drives the whole period. And so all of a sudden, because we had a terrible quarter in the first quarter, you had red here, red, 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 right? And now you have a great quarter and all of a sudden the cumulative past three and five year performance turns back to green. So it's, you know, standardized performance where you're looking at what happened over the course of one or three or five years is really just averaging, of course, the entire period. And when you have abrupt, big performance um, returns, that's going to drive a lot of what you're seeing, even in longer periods. So I'd say that I say this to you to say, you know, when you're seeing something like, oh, geez, the market, you know, has been down for the one, the three, the five-year period, will it ever come back? One thing to bear in mind is that it may not have been down necessarily for those periods. It's just that because you had a recent performance that was um, a big piece, right, when it averaged in with the rest of it, it takes the entire index down um, for that period, right? It takes the entire performance uh, negative for that period. And of course, positive can work the same way. So good news for quarter two, certainly in global markets. As I say, you see uh, a snapback across Stocks, U.S. stocks are leading, but certainly pretty uh, nice double-digit performance even for international and emerging markets. And now we have positive performance in all three areas for the three-year period, which is nice. Um, bond markets, now they, they performed fine in the, in the second quarter. U.S. bonds did a little bit better than international, and um, the, the credit story here is what's driving some of that. So if you uh, looked at, you know, credit risk of any kind in the first quarter, kind of got, it kind of took a hit, right? So when we think about bonds, we'll think about that for a second. We have U.S. Treasuries, which is obviously government bonds that don't, that don't carry a lot of credit risk. You don't have this risk of default that you do with corporate credit bonds. Um, but at the same time, uh, when you go into the corporate sector, you may get a little bit more yield, but you also take on some risk, right? Because you take the risk of potential default. So we did see credit kind of took a hit in the first quarter, and now we see that it's doing better in the second quarter. So a similar story to what we're seeing on the stock market side, the overall being first quarter, just any risk assets kind of took a hit, and they took a heavy hit, uh, particularly equities. Um, and now in the second quarter, we saw just 
a, a big comeback across markets. So let's, let's hit the second slide, the next slide. So one way to look at global markets, we just look now across just big geographies, right? So we looked at US, international developed and emerging markets, and we looked at um, you know, major bond asset classes. This slide, we're gonna drill in a little bit more and say, well, let's look at just what the sub asset classes are doing. So within US, uh, I'd let, we're interested in hearing, well, what is U.S. growth doing? What is U.S. value doing, right? So U.S. growth, higher price stocks, how are they performing? U.S. value, lower price stocks, how are they performing? Small cap, how are they performing? And you can see here for quarter two, uh, an interesting kind of phenomenon here where the U.S. growth stocks came back to the top of the, top of the list here. And we're going to talk, as Pat said, about what's driving the market in general and what, and, and I'm going to, you know, foreshadow here, the answer, of course, is, is big U.S. growth companies. Again, high cost companies relative to their fundamentals, high market price. And we're talking uh, in, in large part about a few very big companies that are driving markets right now. And so that's showing up here when you look at quarter two, where you have a ranking of all the sub asset class performances. You can see right at the top of the list, the big winners are those large growth companies, those big higher priced companies that would include those big tech stocks like Amazon, et cetera. Um, but we also saw a comeback um, in US small cap, which was nice. Um, and then as you can see, really, as you go down the line, um, really all the, uh, the indexes um, had good performance in Q2. So let's hit next slide. And now let's talk about factors. So if you're a symmetry investor, uh, you've probably heard or, and, and should have heard from uh, your advisor or symmetry or, or the material that uh, what we're doing in your portfolio is we're employing factors, right? So factors, and, and maybe the way you've heard about this is evidence-based investing or an academic approach. So factors are basically what we would call kind of the drivers of returns in portfolios. So on the first slide, we looked at big asset classes. The second slide, we looked at smaller sub-asset classes, kind of the division of those big asset classes. Factors are a different way of looking at the market. Factors are saying, put aside whether it's a large company or a small company, and look at some of the variables that academics have found that drive returns. So these are characteristics of stocks that drive returns in the market. So what am I talking about by characteristics of stocks? Well, I'm talking about are they high price stocks or low price stocks, right? Value would be low price stocks, regardless of whether they're big or small. Size would be, are they a big company or are they a small company, right? Those two kind of match the sub asset classes. But then you have something like momentum. Momentum is stocks that have performed well on a stock return basis in the most recent period versus stocks that have it, right? So that doesn't map over to one of those sub-asset classes because the high momentum stock could be in any asset class. It means, did the stock have a good return recently? And if it did have a good return recently, the academic evidence suggests that it will continue to have a good return for a certain period of time. Quality. Quality is talking to us now about the company underlying the stock. So what is the profitability of that company, right? Whatever sub-asset class it's in, we're grouping together now all the companies that have good profitability. Um, you know, other measures of quality can be things like they have uh, their profits come from, they, they have a lot of cash flow versus uh, their accrual-based profits. Um, it could look at things like what's their default risk, et cetera, leverage ratios. So, so quality is another important factor that academics have determined kind of can drive returns. Minimum volatility, this is another factor. Um, and this factor, again, goes back to stock price and says, is this company's stock volatile, meaning moving very, you know, abruptly and, and in, in higher magnitudes, or is it relatively more stable in how the stock price moves over time? So minimum volatility are the stocks that are more stable. So we're saying the stocks that are more stable, the stock price is not violently gyrating the way some of the other stocks in the market might be going. So these are equity factors that academics have kind of said drive a lot of, it's a, it's a good lens through which to view your, your, your stock portfolio because academics have kind of said, 
this, these, these um, ways of looking at it can tell us something about what's working in the market at any given time and what's not. And over time, Symmetry's view of the academic evidence is that over time, these factors tend to outperform, right? So low price stocks tend to outperform high price stocks over time. It's, it's very clear from the chart that that hasn't worked in the past 10 years. Um, you know, and, and that's largely driven by that, the success of those large growth companies, those high priced companies, those really big high priced companies are continuing to get higher price, right? So they're, they're sort of outpacing the value stock. So you're seeing, even though um, you see kind of the red, the red is telling you how it's doing in relation to the market. But even, even though it's red, of course, we still see that there's positive performance there. So I want to make sure that that's clears, right? So if you look at the past 10 years of value, what you're seeing here is positive 10% performance, which is not, you know, um, a, a bad outcome per se, but relative to the market, where it's more even between these big growth companies and the, and the value companies, um, it, it didn't perform as well. So value and size have done poorly you know, in, in, in enough periods during these 10, 5, 3, uh, and one year period that they are not as, you know, they're not outpacing the market. Momentum has done very well as a factor. You can see that it's up over these periods. Quality in large part has done well. It's interesting that in the second quarter, quality was underperforming the market a bit, but you can see that it still had a pretty nice return. It wasn't a, it wasn't a terrible showing. Uh, minimum volatility. This is an interesting story because the types of companies that uh, constitute minimum volatility are the types of companies that tend to have lower volatility in general. But of course, we're in a unique period here, right? So what's performing well now is stocks that might be good with things like social distancing. So if you think about what's going on in the market in, in Q2, what's really coming back better than other things? It's things that are going to, it's, it's companies that are going to do better in a COVID type environment. And that's not necessarily the type of company that over time is more stable. So our expectation would be that we'll return to kind of these fundamentals. These, these sort of fundamentals will sort of reassert themselves over time. But in any given quarter, and particularly a quarter like this, where we're experiencing what's going on with COVID, um, you can see uh, differences in what the long run expectation would be. Finally, the fixed income factors, the major fixed income factors, of course, are interest rate and credit risk. Interest rate just means how long is the bond, right? If, I, if I'm willing to lend somebody money for 10 years, I expect to earn more on that than if I'm only lending the money for one year. So interest rate risk is just saying, what's the return on allowing somebody to borrow the money for a longer period of time? Credit risk, of course, is, is essentially default risk, right? It, it encompasses other things, but you can think of it as the risk that you're not going to get paid. The company is not going to be able to do that for you. And as you can see, both were actually up in the quarter, credit risk by a much bigger margin. So uh, again, erasing what we saw in the first quarter, kind of going right the opposite of what you would have seen in the first quarter. If you were looking at the credit risk uh, slide in the first quarter, you saw it was down all the way down to the five-year period. So with that, I am going to now hand this over to Casey to kind of take over and just talk to us a little bit about uh, what's going on in, in uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry, I have one more slide, I believe. Um, or Casey, are you taking this one? No, Dana, go ahead. I'll grab this one and then, okay, I'll hand it off to you. So one last slide for me. This is growth of multi-factor portfolios over time. So I just talked to you through what do we mean by factors. Um, and of course, again, just to, to reiterate, these are variables that academics have said help us understand stock returns. Things like how well is the stock done in terms of the stock price over time, how high is the price of the stock relative to the, the fundamentals of the company, et cetera. So one thing we like to look at is, okay, we looked at these various periods that I just showed you, but let's look at growth of $100,000, let's say, in any one of these factors over time. So we're not so connected to just, well, how was performance in the latest period? So this goes all the way back 20 years and shows the, the multi-factor portfolios, how they perform. And small cap, which we know is one of the ones that we looked at and really kind of struggling in recent years, was actually a great performer if you go back the full 20-year period. 
Value for a 20 year period, still kind of struggling. That's in green there. So not to say that value didn't perform well in the 10 years prior necessarily, but certainly on a cumulative basis. Um, you know, and, and again, like you can have years that are up or down for these factors. Um, what you're gonna see when you look at a cumulative or what you're gonna see when you look at standardized returns is if I average it all out, where did it come out to, right? So over a 20 year period, if I average the whole thing out, where I'm coming out is kind of a lot of these factors have outperformed that S&P 500 uh, benchmark, but um, that, you know, there, there still is some struggle with some of those factors. Okay, let's, and uh, you know, one thing I'll say as we move to the next slide, this is a big piece of why the symmetry philosophy really stresses diversification of the factors, right? Just as we would say to you, don't put all of your eggs in one stock or a few stocks, don't put all your eggs in just U.S. stocks, right? We all know the lost decade and, and you know, as much as U.S. stocks are doing great now, these things are cyclical. If you looked at the market in 2000 and 2009, you actually had a negative return in U.S. stocks over that period. So symmetry is very much about diversifying in every way that you can, um, you know, diversify across geographies, diversify across those sub-asset classes, and diversify across these factors, these sources of returns that the academics have identified tend to pay off over time. All right, Casey, this time it is you. I'm gonna hand it off. Uh, thank you, Dana. Uh, clearly, positive returns across uh, most risk assets uh, delivered a respite from the, the wild ride of the first quarter. Uh, however, the pronounced recovery across equities and credit uh, may well be running ahead of the underlying health, social, and macroeconomic story. Uh, uncertainty abounds, and, and it is this uncertainty which can lead to increased market volatility in the months to come. It's important for investors to maintain some perspective while observing the stories playing out in the headlines. So. What are some of the stories with the potential to move markets? Well, uh, obviously, uh, unfortunately, the pandemic continues to dominate headlines. Uh, the increase that we observed in volatility in late June uh, related to COVID-19 cases rising in many of the U.S. states should serve as a reminder that markets and the economy in general are at the mercy of virus-related news. What we know, or uh, what we think we know, positive tests tend to run ahead of hospitalizations by a week or two, and hospitalizations seem to run ahead of deaths by two or three weeks. So the uptick in uh, positives and hospitalizations in June suggests the very real possibility of an increase in deaths. First and foremost, that's obviously uh, uh, prompts humanitarian concerns. But as investors, it, it also has the potential to move markets. We continue to observe that the course of the virus and the social and political response to the public health realities will determine the course of economic recovery. Regarding the economy, one area that uh, we observe uh, showing up in the headlines and, and has the potential uh, to move markets has to do uh, with jobs. Um, what we observe uh, from the, the bottom of uh, March and April when uh, millions upon millions uh, of uh, our fellow uh, Americans uh, were either put on furlough or laid off uh, as the pandemic put a large swath of economic activity, activity on hold, that job growth from that time has actually surpassed uh, economists' forecasts. And uh, the rebound in putting millions of workers back to work has been broad-based. Uh, it's cut across industries and demographic groups. Uh, and employers have indeed brought back millions uh, more workers as businesses have reopened across the country. However, it's important not to confuse 
a rebound with a recovery. The damage done to the economy as a result of the sudden stop and long-term reallocation of activity among both uh, the supply and demand side could, could likely impede the economic recovery for years to come. As we observe, there are still nearly 15 million fewer jobs in June than in February before the pandemic forced businesses to close. And yes, the unemployment rate has fallen to a little over 11% over the course of June, down from a peak of 14.7% in April. Uh, it is still higher than any previous period since World War II. And, and these numbers uh, don't take into account um, those folks who are considered unemployed on temporary layoff, or those who are not currently looking for a job, or those who are considered underemployed. If we include uh, these categories, that would drive the 11% unemployment number closer to something uh, akin to uh, almost a quarter of the workforce. And while we uh, observe the recovery, it is highly likely that the jobs numbers that get reported weekly, we had a, a jobs report uh, this morning, in fact, quarterly, uh, monthly, they will continue to uh, surface in the headlines uh, with potential uh, market um, moving uh, capacity, depending on the strength of those numbers. Another issue that is a potential to move markets is the dichotomy that we have observed uh, in stocks themselves between technology and the rest of the market. I'd like to invite uh, Dana to, to rejoin us and drill a little bit deeper into uh, that issue. Dana? Thank you, Casey. So what we're talking about with this uh, giant five is really, um, you know, it's not that we haven't seen something like this before where large tech stocks uh, really dominate, but what we're seeing is is that we have a very top-heavy market right now, right? So what does that mean? It means that whereas it appears, as Casey said, that the market is sort of getting ahead of perhaps the economy in terms of uh, what's, what's returning well and not returning well, um, you know, the, the giant five, the so-called Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Fang, or F-A-M-A-G, however you want to put it, are really driving much of the market return that we're seeing. And, and the, the issue with that, of course, is that now you have idiosyncratic risk in the portfolio, meaning, um, again, we're very much proponents of diversification for a reason. We don't want your portfolio to be overly dependent on any one area, type of stock, uh, stock, industry, et cetera, because of course we know that two things can happen in this case. One, um, you can have a bad outcome for those stocks, and then a, a great deal of the portfolio is impacted by that. So what would be a bad, out, bad outcome? Well, you know, you're looking at five stocks that are all in very similar type of industry. They have correlated risks. So regulatory scrutiny, which we're seeing right now in terms of privacy concerns, that would be an example of a trigger that could kind of disproportionately impact those stocks and have a, an impact on their return. Um, and then the second concern about a big top heavy market like this is that even if nothing happens that disproportionately affects those stocks, you have the possibility that they just can't live up to the high prices they've been up, been up to. So uh, the analogy that I like to use, and I'm in New England, so I talk about the New England Patriots. But what I like to say to folks is the Patriots are a great team, but at a certain point spread, even the Patriots aren't a good bet anymore, right? If you saddle them with too much expectation, then the return you're going to get is not going to be what you'd like, right? And that's what the concern would be about these big five, because their prices have been, been bid off based on the expectation that in a COVID-type world, they will do better, right? Everybody's online. Everybody's sitting home. We expect Google and Amazon to fare well in this. The problem is the stock price gets bid up so high because of that expectation of higher future cash flows from those companies relative to other companies that it's unclear whether we can expect that the stockholder 
actually get the better return, even if they do as well as expected, right? Even if those stocks do as well as, as kind of you could expect them to do, have higher cash flows. It's just that you're paying a high price for that right now. And the danger in a market like this is that they've become such a big piece of the actual market cap weight. So the first chart you're seeing there on the left is showing you from 2017, the progression of what percent of the, of the U.S. Wilshire 5000 is the index here, but what that means is the U.S. market, right? The broad U.S. market. What percent do the top five stocks constitute? And we've gone, of course, as you can see there, from about 10% all the way up to 20 plus percent, right? So 20%, if you're invested in an S&P 500, 20 plus percent of your portfolio is all concentrated in these five stocks. And the other kind of takeaway, and, and there was a Market Watch article on this that we pulled some of these charts from because we thought they were uh, very illustrative for people to see. Um, if you took, in the last, since, since January 2017, if you took out those giant five stocks, your return actually was worse than just cash from January 2017 all the way through this latest quarter. So, so what you're seeing there is what you would have earned in a market weight investment if you had just not had those giant five stocks. So it's not to say, of course, that this has been a bad investment. Certainly the S&P 500 has done very well, we know that, but our message to folks would be, think twice if you're thinking, well, maybe, the go maybe what I should do is just focus my investments and concentrate there. Symmetry is still strong believers in diversifying across different assets, even, even though it has underperformed over the recent period. I would tell you if we could have timed it and we could have been in those big stocks, you know, knowing knowing the past, right? If we could have gone ex ante and, and focused everything there beforehand, of course, that would have been a great thing to do. Um, timing these things is not an easy thing to do. Uh, you know, you look at the last 10 years and um, it, it's been a very great uh, large growth type of a period um, and, and largely driven by those stocks. But what we would say is past you know, what's done well recently is not necessarily what's going to do well going forward. And I can tell you that a lot, this is kind of a concern right now for a lot of money managers. A lot of managers are looking at this. A lot of economists are talking about it, talking about the fact that people kind of might be concentrating in the S&P 500, considering that they have a, a diversified investment and they do have sort of a top heavy risk going on. Um, I'm going to give another sort of example of a, a way to think about this. So um, this is a growth of, um, or, or rather a percentage increase for um, Domino's, the stock return there versus the big tech companies. So Domino's, of course, pizza restaurant, um, and we're just going back in this case to 2010. So we're looking at um, well, close, to, close to 10 years, a um, little over. And just saying, okay, from January 2010, you know, what was your best stock return? And, um, you know, you would have thought, right, even knowing the market that we're in now, you would have said, oh, probably the big five, right? Because they've, they've done so well in the last several years. Domino has actually outperformed um, over that period of time. Why do we bring this up? Uh, to say that what seems to be the obvious thing, when you, when you carry it through to who's going to win from a stock return perspective, is not always the obvious thing because again you have that variable in there of price so even if you can kind of say well i think i know which companies are going to do better in an environment like this it's not the same thing as saying i know which stocks are going to do better because the market is a very efficient mechanism for price setting right all of the all of the people in the market that all the managers all of the uninformed traders all that comes together and says what is the price, you know, you've got people bidding something up, people selling it off, and the price in the market is very hard to outsmart. That price is set by, a, by the whole multitude of market participants who are looking at that and saying, this is my expectation about what these companies are going to pay out in the future. This is how much I'm willing to pay for that expectation. So, so figuring out that well, I think Amazon and Google are going to do well as companies in the next one, three, five years is not the same thing as saying they're going to do well for stockholders in the next one, three, five. Can we time, you know, any of this? Can we say for sure? Yeah, it certainly it's possible that they just, their prices just keep going up higher, that their cash flows exceed expectations. 
Um, any of these things are possible, right? The, the market price is an average of all those different participants. So some participants think, no, nope, it's not even high enough. I mean, I want to bid it even higher. Other participants are saying, oh, it's way overvalued at this point. Um, I'm going to, you know, it's a sale, right? So the market price is, is an estimate on the average. We can't tell you when or whether for sure something happens with any of these stocks. What we can do, the antidote for that risk, diversification, right? Don't just own the Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google. Put dominoes in there. Dominoes may pay off over time, right? And, and not just dominoes, right? All the dominoes. We're talking about um, diversify across stocks to the best of your ability. And then our, our uh, you know, other major tenet is, hey, let's leverage these evidence-based factors that the academics have afforded us that say over time tend to pay off. So I'm gonna stop there and hand this back over. And I believe Pat, you're gonna come on and kind of wind us up. Thank you, Dana. Uh, yeah, I, I really would like to, uh... Uh, remind you and um, drive home two points that we made on this presentation. And these are points I've been making since 1994 when we started this company. And they remain as true today as they do then, as they did then. Uh, it's just easy in times of stress, in times of volatility, to forget these very important messages and these very important lessons. Uh, Dana alluded to the fact that from 2000 to 2009, U.S. stocks had a negative return. And now we see from 2010 to 2020, American stocks have done exceptionally well. So is it really any surprise? We had a 10-year period at the beginning of the millennium where stocks had a negative return, cumulatively speaking, down about 10%. And now they've outperformed their historical return over the last 10 years. It makes perfect sense. It's easy to see this in hindsight. It's difficult to predict it. But it wouldn't be, uh, in my estimation, it wouldn't be uh, taking a big gamble to say that U.S. stocks might not have great returns over the next five years or so. Uh, that's why we remain diversified, and that's why we still own stocks in Europe and Asia and emerging markets. That's point number one. Point number two and, and some of it is made in this summary here. Um, what can you do? It is, it's an adage that we've always followed at our firm, that there are certain things in your control and certain things out of your control. And so focus on what's in your control. What's in your control are taxes that you pay. Are you investing in a tax efficient manner? The cost of investing. You should be aware of what you're paying your advisor, what you're paying symmetry partners. What are the costs of investing? Because Costs due to investing come out of the investor's returns. And risk. We spend a lot of time talking about risk. You control the amount of risk you take. Um, we try to uh, tamp down risk through broad diversification. You can control all three of those things as an informed investor. Uh, what's out of your control? Very simply, returns. Unfortunately, this is what most people focus on. The returns of the market are what they are. Historically, uh, stocks in this country and stocks in other countries have returned approximately 9 to 10%. Uh, the longer the time period, the more you hone in on that 9 to 10% return. The shorter the time period, the dispersion around returns, the variance, the, the roller coaster ride of markets have returns going up 40% one year and down 30% the next. So it's very difficult to control that. However, if you have the proper time horizon, we believe if you're going to invest in stocks, it should be over five years. And if you uh, have taken the time to sit down with your advisor and discuss your tolerance for risk, which is really a discussion about what keeps you up at night and what allows you to sleep at night, that's all. Uh, then your advisor can make an informed decision on, well, how much exposure should you have to stocks? 20%, 40, 60? etc. That's what you can control. And that's what you should focus on. Tune out the noise. Tune out the media where uh, finances and markets are concerned. Um, there, there are some media participants who give good advice, uh, but it tends to be the same advice. And how often uh, will these financial programs have someone on 
who says, keep your costs down, stay broadly diversified. Uh, it's a boring message. So it doesn't turn a lot of heads. So you get a lot of sensational messages uh, from the media where markets are concerned. And we suggest you tune those out. It'll give you a much better chance of uh, nights where you can sleep rather than sleepless nights. On behalf of Symmetry Partners, I'd like to thank you for your confidence and for your business. And uh, let's hand it over to Casey. Thank you. Pat, thank you very much. Uh, as a reminder uh, to our listeners, if you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the GoToWebinar toolbar. We have uh, a number of questions that have come in, uh, and I will uh, consolidate a group of them uh, and pose the question to you, uh, Pat. Uh, the question along the lines of the election upcoming, uh, the election season, the potential for market volatility around elections, some fear around uh, one candidate winning versus another is now a time to sell. Can you speak a little bit to uh, your thoughts around the election cycle itself and this particular election coming up? Yeah, absolutely, Case. And uh, uh, if you're looking carefully at your camera right now, you can see me smiling. We get this question every four years, and uh, our answer hasn't changed. And uh, uh, it is interesting because the markets do have a short-term reaction to um, uh, who wins the election. Uh, we have a lot of data, but what you'll find is when you when you want to draw some conclusions about stock prices and markets, we don't have nearly enough data points to tell you uh, if uh, the Republicans control the Senate and the Democrats control the House and the Republicans keep the White House, this will happen. If the Democrats sweep and have both houses of Congress and win the White House, this will happen. There aren't simply enough data points to have a high level of confidence to tell you what will happen. So having said that, uh, the, the story remains the same, stay diversified. But if we go back to the last presidential election, regardless of what side of the aisle you yourself come down on, I think it's safe to say that the underdog won the election for the White House. None of the major media uh, outlets were calling for uh, Trump to win the White House. Uh, a number of media outlets were also subsequently calling for the market to drop because we had an inexperienced uh, president. So uh, neither of those things happened. Uh, the upcoming election, um, uh, I think uh, the same rules apply. Um, we don't make predictions and we don't make tactical decisions on, on what to do with your portfolio based on whether or not the president keeps the White House or um, the presumptive candidate for the Democrats, Senator Biden, uh, Vice President Biden wins. So uh, we'll keep the portfolios as they are. What I want you to stay away from is those of you who are listening to this who are political wonks, such as myself, I follow politics closely. Many times in this instance, our passion gets in the way of a uh, rational data-driven evidence-based decision where our investments are concerned. So, uh, it is uh, simply not the case that this is a particularly um, emotional time. Uh, history of our country shows, the history of our country shows in presidential elections, uh, uh, this has happened several times where the country appears divided. This is nothing new. And uh, we survive and we overcome. What I will tell you is, and what should give you comfort, regardless of who you would like to see in the White House, is that one of the brilliant things about our political system is the uh, president is removed every four to eight years, uh, free and open elections that um, we begin to take for granted here that many other places around the world don't have, uh, all ensures um, that markets uh, can move the way markets are supposed to move, meaning representing the underlying fortunes of the companies that make up those markets. In the short term, politics will move markets. Uh, but in the long term, two things move markets, tax policy and the underlying fortunes of the companies that make up the market. So uh, we strongly recommend that you pick an asset allocation that is appropriate for your time horizon and risk tolerance. Talk with your financial advisor about it and do not react to the elections in the short term. 
uh, where your money is concerned. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate it. Another question that we got in, uh, I believe, uh, is probably uh, best answered by Dana. And it's a question uh, along the lines of an overweight towards the U.S. Uh, has been has served uh, investors well over the past decade. Is there a reason why we would want to maintain an overweight towards the U.S. Uh, moving forward? Or, or is this really time to think about um, emerging markets, international developed? Can you help us make the case for um, diversification and weighting within uh, portfolios towards these different geographies? Um, yeah, thank you. That's a, a great question. I don't know that there's a right answer. I certainly um, would say that my view, uh, you know, given all the information that has kind of shared a lot of it today, is that uh, it's, it's entirely possible that U.S. markets do underperform uh, ex-U.S. markets going forward. The timing of that uh, could be two, three years out. You know, we don't know. It could never materialize, right? So when you're in a situation where you're looking at so the metrics that we have available to us, among the most important are valuation metrics, right? Literally, same thing as kind of the style factor of value that we talked about earlier. What is the cost? What is the price in terms of the stock price that you pay to invest in U.S. stocks versus ex-U.S. stocks? Those kinds of indicators, what we've found over time, the empirical research on this, is that they're good for giving you a sense of what the long-run Expected or even I could say midterm expected return is so five to seven years. They're not good for trying to time it. So the fact that valuations are where they are in a given period doesn't tell you much about what's going to happen in the next year or two. So for that reason, we would say that you, you we would not advocate that you leave U.S. stocks, right? Because at some point maybe it flips. Maybe we have another lost decade. You don't know when that's going to happen, and getting out of any market risks that you kind of miss the return associated with that market. What is the right posture? How much percent should we have of U.S. versus ex-U.S.? This is, you know, kind of, um, it's a question that we look at and, and we look at in the portfolios, and, and we're actually uh, kind of examining right now. Um, we do like to maintain in, in certain of our portfolios an overweight to U.S., it's not because we necessarily think U.S. stocks will outperform ex-U.S. stocks. It's because our investors are largely and, and almost entirely domiciled in the United States. So they're buying in U.S. dollars. They are experiencing, you know, kind of a comparison and tracking error to the U.S. market. So we do tend to keep this U.S. overweight in um, certain of our portfolios. We do have other portfolios where we say, we're not going to make a U.S. overweight. So if we have clients who say, yeah, I would rather just have the market cap weight, right, which is, is, is it's basically saying it's neutral. It's saying, as I said before, the stock price is a pretty good indicator. So I'm going to be, past, other than the factors where we're overweighting those factors, I'm going to try to kind of be neutral to whether U.S. stocks or ex-U.S. stocks are going to outperform. I know I can't predict it but I don't want to have overweight that are based on, you know, my particular situation, the fact that I'm a U.S. investor. So we do offer portfolios that kind of give you the choice on that. And that's something that you and your advisor can figure out which one makes the most sense for you. Uh, we also have ways that you can decide, hey, look, if, if your view is, uh, you know, I, I think I'd like a little overweight to XUS, um, we have different ways you can accomplish that in your portfolio with your advisor. You can um, talk to your advisor about either using individual symmetry funds where you can increase the weight or, or as I say, kind of combining uh, some of these other models that we have that allow for that. So long story short, you know, we, we don't have a prediction. Uh, we don't think you can time which economies are going to do better at which point. We think at a high level, the best thing to do is kind of just stay diversified across all of them. And then, you know, depending on which benchmark you really care about, right? So if you're, if you're a U.S. investor, U.S. stocks are underperforming, even having, you know, 20 to 30 percent of your portfolio in XUS, you're going to be outperforming the benchmark that you care about. And that's kind of, you know, that's a, that's a good place to be. If you are focused on a global benchmark and, you know, you're comfortable with tracking, more tracking area to U.S. markets, then 
maybe a little bit higher cost because uh, it, it can be a little more costly sometimes to invest in XUS than you then you might uh, take the opposite position. So, you know, at a high level, I would say to you, it's, it's certainly a consideration. We consider it in our own portfolios about whether the posture is right. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't know that I'd say there's a definite right or wrong, um, you know, in terms of this. There would be if we thought we could time it. Uh, since we don't think we can time it, we think that it's, it's good to sort of, you know, kind of offer if you, you know, you want the global market cap, you can kind of get that. If you want sort of the overweight that's more geared to what a typical U.S. investor expects, then we make that available as well. Thank you, Dana. Appreciate that response. Uh, if we haven't been able to get to your question, uh, please uh, know that uh, we are available to you. We're always happy to continue the dialogue. We do publish uh, these slides that uh, we shared with you today, along with a written market commentary. Uh, so if you'd like to see that, please feel free to speak with your advisor or have your advisor speak with their point of contact at Symmetry, and we can make those available to you. Thank you all very much for taking the time to join us today. We appreciate you. We appreciate your partnership, and we look forward to working with you uh, in the years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.